Hello everybody, my name is Pablo Wojcowski. I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University and director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you for joining us for today's weekly virtual seminar of the Center. It is really a pleasure to have you with us. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media and Latinx communities across the Americas. Today's speaker is a leading scholar in this space. Ireja Marcas Ramirez is Associate Professor of Journalism Studies and Media Theory at the Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City. Jose Quintero Ramirez, a graduate student in the Program in Rhetoric and Public Culture at Northwestern University and an affiliate at the Center for Latinx Digital Media, will introduce Mireja in just a minute. But before we do that, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, Ojibwe, Otawatomi, and Odawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native peoples and the institution's history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service and involvement efforts. Let me briefly say how the seminar will unfold. First, in just a few seconds, Jose will tell us more about Mireja's research and career. Then she will deliver her seminar. After that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar. Jose will moderate. At the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many thanks for joining us. And without further ado, Jose, the screen is all yours. Thank you for the introduction, Pablo, and hi, everyone. It is a real treat to be able to introduce Dr. Mireya Marquez Ramirez. Dr. Marquez Ramirez is an Associate Professor of Journalism Studies in Media Theory at the Department of Communications in the Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City. She earned her Doctor of Philosophy in Media and Communications from Goldsmiths University in London and her Master of Arts in Journalism Studies from Cardiff University in the UK. She was appointed as a level two member of Mexico's system of national researchers by the National Council of Science and Technology. Her research interests include comparative media systems, comparative journalism cultures, journalistic role performance, journalistic professionalism, news production, journalism, violence, and sports journalism. She is the principal investigator of the journalistic role performance study in Mexico and has participated either leading or co-leading Mexico's chapter in other cross-national comparative studies such as Worlds of Journalism and Journalism Students Global. She has published a book in over 20 chapters and articles in high impact journals like Press Politics, Journal of Communications and Journalism Studies. Finally, she's member of the editorial boards of Journalism Studies and Spain's Estudios sobre el Mensaje Periodístico. Join me in welcoming Dr. Mireya Marquez Ramirez. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to uh, present today about um, contemporary journalism in my country. Um, so I assume you can see my screen. Once again, thank you very much for the invitation to this uh, Latino digital media virtual seminar ser series. And what I'm going to talk today is about how award-winning journalists uh, in my country are trying to rebuild uh, their field by repairing um, the journalistic paradigm, like a concept that uh, has been popular um, between journalism scholars globally. Um, this is my Twitter handle. And um, well, the aims and research questions of uh, the study that I'm presenting today, an ongoing study, it is yet to be finalized in, in uh, following months, is to study uh, the rebuilding of a field 
through the conceptual lens of paradigm repair. Um, and I'm going to do that through the analysis of award-winning independent journalist professional trajectories and the visions of their field. So the three most important questions that I have followed uh, in the past months is how are these high profile independent journalists relating or building relationships with their peers and impacting in their field? Also, how are they envisioning a societal or a new fresh societal mission? Uh, and what kind of professional issues or troubles are they addressing and how? Um, so, I mean, I, I guess that the first um, issue to address is why a paradigm? Um, why fix it if it ain't broken? And, um, and for that, we need to go back to, um, to uh, the, the famous Thomas Kohn. I, I guess we all have to read him in uh, BA studies in our degrees. I read him in my first semester. Um, and um, what my professors wanted me to learn from reading him was how um, the scientific paradigms are always evolving. So just to remember, remind you, Thomas Kohn speaks about how, uh, how scientific revolutions are structured through um, scientific paradigms. So he understands scientific paradigms as a body of generally accepted practices and knowledge. And uh, they, they are useful for supplying problems for scientists to law, but at the same time, they provide the tools for their solution. And um, so, you know, the point of paradigms is that they remain constant before going through a shift and they shift or they change when there are cor current theories that no longer can explain certain phenomena. So when that happens, then a new paradigm has to emerge and replace the so-called old one. Um, why? Because then flaws and weaknesses can no longer be ignored or explained away. Um, so lots of, of um, Newton's theories and, uh, you know, the, the theories in physics and in chemistry and so on uh, work this way. But of course, neither humanities nor social sciences have straight cut paradigms which then can be discarded and, you know, replaced by others. But it is a useful concept, certainly, to understand how this works um, for journalism and plenty of scholars throughout the decades, particularly in the United States, have used this idea of paradigm repair to apply to the journalistic paradigm. Because if there is a profession with a very strong professional culture, tenets, ideals, and norms, that is certainly journalism. So colleagues can stay there uh, in, in a review paper of the concept, uh, talk about how uh, paradigm repair emerged in instances where wrongdoing and normative practices by anyone in the field draw public attention and criticism. And this, in turn, undermines journalism authority. So what journalists do every time that some kind of crisis emerge is to, to, to respond strongly um, to this crisis when they threaten either professionals, uh, journalist authority, or their credibility, or their sense of legitimacy in order to restore its professional status. Um, and we see this happen a lot lately due to fake news and, and misinformation and the attacks of certain populist presidents like Trump or like um, in, th uh, throughout Latin America. Uh, and and uh, the, the most appropriate example for this, I'm going to return to those slides later, uh, uh, is when Jorge Ramos stood up in a, in a press conference of, of the then candidate Donald Trump, and then he challenged him about his uh, proposed immigration policies when he was a candidate. And, um, you know, most of uh, uh, Latino journalists in the U.S. supported him, 
but also even Latin American journalists as well. Um, and um, I, I like to give this example because Jorge Ramos is, is a famous graduate of my university. He's an, uh, an Ibero uh, graduate. And, um, but he certainly, if, if you remember, I think this was four years ago, uh, he drew a lot of criticism from his peers. And um, so instead of rallying around a fellow member of the press, many journalists did not necessarily side with Trump, but certainly against uh, Ramos. And then he went on a tour to explain his, himself to say why in some cases, like proposed immigration policies like Trump's, uh, didn't need an, an, an objectivity or detached or dispassionate approach to journalism, but on the contrary, a very explicitly active way of approaching problems. And this, I think, has caused a lot more, um, a lot of controversy in the US. Um, so the paradigm repair in journalism, according to Tim Boss and more, uh, is that a paradigm itself is largely implicit and hegemonic. And it consists of unwritten codes of conduct or patterns of behavior that journalists follow without explicit rationalization. And this means that um, every time I interview a journalist, and, and bear in mind, I have interviewed over 150 journalists, not only political journalists, but sports journalists as well, even showbiz journalists. And invariable, invariably, all of them have some kind of should be or some kind of principles to which they adhere. On top of that, uh, Sally Hughes from University of Miami and myself were in charge of the Worlds of Journalism study in Mexico. Uh, uh, if you are not familiar with, with the study, it is a worldwide uh, survey comparative project uh, that is um, conducted in more than 80 countries around the world. So essentially we all have to, to conduct the same uh, survey with the same instruments. Um, and then we are allowed to add our own kind of national uh, questions in the survey. But anyway, the point, uh, the point was that Mexican journalists uh, from all the corners of the country have always or always adhered to certain journalistic roles. That's why uh, journalistic roles have become a very popular object of study. So, but uh, often journalists don't even rationalize what those missions or roles or uh, societal missions are. And, and when, when you talk to them, even informally, they kind of give you a very informal or, 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 or a variety of the same thing, social responsibility, ethics, um, uh, detachment and so forth. So there are things that are kind of consensual and the debate goes on whether journalistic culture are universal and global or whether they are uh, that different and therefore geographically or nationally situated. Um, um, I, I, I am of the idea that uh, there, there are kind of hybrid journalistic culture with universal tenet, but also with local applications of or practices of those tenets. Anyway, so uh, Boss and Moore claim that new entrants into the file internalize the norms and values of the paradigm through the process of socialization. And, and scholars of newsmaking and news production have already demonstrated how a kind of osmosis process uh, occurs within newsrooms and then journalists learn from their peers and from their seniors and, and, and they, are, they get told off by their bosses. So they, that's how they learn what those norms and values of the paradigm are. Um, so for instance, if a newsroom values objectivity over everything else, then they learn not to give any opinion or, or, or any guiding um, uh, in for, um, language in, in their reporting that suggests they are taking any side. Uh, not that that happens, but it's just an example. 
So members of the journalistic community deploy discursive strategies to defend the paradigmatic status quo from a perceived internal threat. So in response to these perceived violations of norms, values, and practices that constitute the paradigm, journalists position uh, or place the offending parties as outsiders um, to strengthen their identity and reassure the public. So this means that every time a, a journalist violates the unwritten codes or rules, then he or she is cast aside. Um, and uh, the literature gives plenty of examples of American journalism, as, um, for example, White House correspondents, the veteran House uh, White correspondent Helen, oh, sorry, I forgot the surname. Uh, I think she got into trouble for saying some anti Semitic uh, comments. And uh, so she was very respected, but suddenly she was not. So uh, the literature gives those kind of examples to to illustrate what's, what paradigm repair is. Uh, so sometimes in literature, paradigm repair looks a lot to what um, uh, Matt Carlson calls a boundary maintenance. I'm sorry for the, the uh, I'm a bit dyslexic these days. Um, so for example, every time journalism as a profession wants to set aside from fake news or peripheral actors or YouTubers, influencers, user generated content or tabloid news or you know commercial imperatives or WikiLeaks and all of these phenomena at some point are perceived as threats to the paradigm. Uh, not that they are, but they, in certain ways, they are perceived by the agents and internal actors of the journalistic field as threats. So Boss and Moore say that this paradigm repair is kind of a constant phenomenon through, throughout at least American journalism history because every time objectivity or factuality or ethics and many other approaches to journalism were uh, perceived as a threat to, wa to whatever was the paradigm at the time. Um, so the literature, this are example of how the literature addresses. So what is there to repair according to the literature? Well, trust, as we see in this article, or the internet as always, and blogs and, and all of these were always perceived as a threat to journalism legitimacy. Not that, not that it is, but in, in their day in 2002 or 2003, I, I remember these uh, discussions in uh, during my student days. Um, so when Princess Diana died in a crash followed, followed by paparazzis, of course there was a big discussion and controversy about um, about this so-called uh, tabloid journalism pushing the boundaries of what's private and what's public, and you know leading to to tragic results like uh, Princess Diana's death, or uh, when the New York Times acknowledged that Jason Blair had violated all the accepted journalistic standards and basically he made stories up. And, uh, and he fabricated sources and he fabricated facts and, um, and, and no one kind of suspected that this was going on for a long time. But, uh, but after he did that, then the New York Times implemented new policies and, and other journalists also talked about how verification um, was a, the, the, core, the, the core principle of journalism. Um, and here Mark Coddington also talks about WikiLeaks. So this is the way more or less that um, um, scholars have understood uh, the paradigm that needs repairing. Uh, but I think one fair critique that could, um, that could be addressed towards this literature is that I think there is a lot of uh, conceptualizing and theorizing need, need uh, that needs to be done in order to, to kind of operationalize what actually, how a paradigm looks like and, and exactly, you know, the steps of the repairing. So the literature, I don't think has still arrived to the conclusion on whether we know when 
the paradigm was being repaired and, 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 and whether it has been re restored or not. So it, it's sometimes difficult to draw analytical categories that, that leads to that conclusion. But uh, I must be very honest with you in this regard, at least as a, as, as a conceptual concept, I think it is fascinating to name and brand phenomena that we knew were there all this time. So uh, Matt Carlson, for example, uh, proposes a new concept and he says that there is a second order paradigm reaper when it's not just isolating threatening incidents what draw this controversy or this uh, self-defense on the part of journalists who, who then uh, you know want to restore the reputation of the field but it, it might instead be that these incidents are quite um, uh, problems in the field that need fixing so in his view, the second order paradigm reaper generalizes their significance to the profession. So following um, drawing from, from his reflection, uh, this, this is the question that, um, that I ask uh, to guide uh, this study. So what if the bias is increasingly the norm and then the paradigm it needs to actually be implemented um, and I think that's what characterizes my country it, it, unlike American journalism where um, due to Dan Hallin and, and all and Michael Shotson and all these authors we know that there is a professional paradigm of journalism whether we like their principles or not such as subjectivity and so forth uh, because it it was implemented in the early 20s uh, also because journalism schools in the US teach uh, reporting courses and classes, but that's not necessarily the case of other countries like mine, in which the norms and the should be are some um, imported paradigms are not native from our colonial history and past, and therefore they are not so entrenched into journalist ideology. They know there is a should be somewhere but it's not compulsory enforced within newsrooms, let alone new routines or reporting practices. So what if then a paradigm is actually needed to be implemented and, and, and for those, you know, uh, ideolo um, uh, professional uh, perceptions to be actually carried out in, uh, in practice. Why? Because there is a lot to be repaired in Mexican journalism. This picture depicts a former ex-president Enrique Peña Nieto. And this used to be for more than a decade from about 2000 to, to 2016 or something like that. The most um, famous and popular television uh, um, uh, anchor, anchor newsreader. So he hosted the 10 p.m. newscast, and then he also hosted a 3 p.m. radio newscast. So all of the politicians wanted to be interviewed by this Joaquin Lopez Doriga. And the fact that he gets a um, picture, his uh, picture that is very smiling with the president, drew at the time a lot of controversy and a lot of ethical questions about to what extent should high-profile journalists uh, permit the picture taken with, um, with presidents. And for many detractors, this is kind of, this kind of illustrates the collusive relationship between the state and the press that has been going on for decades in the country. So, so I guess I'm going to summarize a semester <laughs> of content into just one slide. Each of these um, elements indeed needs a lot of discussion and a lot of uh, um, theorization on its own term, but here I will try to be synthetic with uh, the structural problems affecting Mexican journalism. And the first is the 
what my colleagues call the asynchronous modernization of the media across the country. So if by modernization, we understand as um, things like standardized practices and uh, a private ownership of the media and advertisement funded media, then this is certainly not the case for all uh, the media around the country. Of course, the most developed uh, media organizations in terms of their infrastructure and their resources are located in Mexico City here in the national capital, but that's not the case of subnational or regional journalism, uh, which are mostly driven by uh, media clientelism and, and what scholars also call media capture. And by media capture, um, there is a kind of consensus to this, to describe that at least in Mexico, the discretionary allocation of public advertising contracts, open or hidden. Open means um, that the government buy airtime or airspace or uh, boy ads. And in exchange, they expect a, a positive coverage or at least not a critical one, but then the worst of it is the hidden advertising, which means planted stories, front page interviews, things that look like genuine news, but they kind of aren't. And only those in, in the field know that this was um, a sold interview or a sold coverage. So as a result, for years and decades, and still in many instances and states, uh, there, there can't to prevail a sycophantic coverage of presidents or governors or those in high profile uh, positions in power. Um, there is also uh, a, a historical high concentration of commercially driven TV property um, and, and, and hence TV organizations and houses become political actors. Uh, on the contrary, there are, uh, for the case of printed media, low readerships, elite oriented newspapers, and what is called um, tabloid press, but not the kind of celebrity tabloid press that is, is, is very common in Anglo Saxon countries, but more of a crime tabloid press, which tends to trivialize crimes and uh, re victimize crime victims. Uh, and as a result, even Halin and many scholars agree that there has been a low professionalism because as I said, there is not a historical development of uh, cons consensual journalistic standards because journalism used, used to be the instrument for political battles as late as, late as 1920. So, so there hasn't been really a lot of uh, chance to develop these professional uh, journalistic standards uh, in, in a widespread way, because also uh, there was an authoritarian like government for more than 70 years in the country. So uh, to go quick, to go quickly, that results in passive reporting practices. Um, when there's critical journalism, it is very often a commodity to blackmail the powerful. So uh, you can print a front page, very critical story about politician and then so, so and, and get him to give you a, an advertising contract. So the, the critical journalism diminishes. And on the contrary, once, uh, if the government refuses to give you advertising contracts, then you, use critical journalism as a power or as a commodity to be sold to the best bidder. And of course, as you may have heard, uh, is one of the riskiest countries to conduct journalism because anti-press violence is very uh, prevalent. Uh, there's uh, journalists killings are on the rise as well as aggressions. And, and the worst of thing is the societal indifference and impunity to prosecute those who kill journalists. So most of the killings remain unsolved. Um, there is also work precarity and low societal trust in journalists and journalism as a result of all this. Um, and lately, because of commercial 
uh, pressures. Uh, there have been many controversies in my country, for example, this TV anchor, uh, was rep uh, we had a terrible earthquake in 2017 with 200 people dead in Mexico City uh, and the kindergarten collapsed and killed as few as 30 children. Um, so when this reported went to the place and she was reporting that there was still a little girl alive on the, the on the, the, the uh, I forgot the word, <laughs> el escombro. Um, the, 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 the country thought that there was in fact a, a live child awaiting rescue, but then it turned out to be a lie. There was no child and there was no little girl and her name was not Frida Sofia as she reported. And then she blamed this, the, her sources and, um, and I think that was all a sham and, and it, it caused a lot of controversy in a time where the country was, was severely affected by, by the losses of the earthquake. So also it, it was revealed that 36 journalists, just as Lopez Doriga, uh, the, the man I showed you earlier, had received a very juicy contracts with the government you know, for millions, they didn't even have to have uh, high ratings or high prestige. Some were even very minor journalists, but still they were getting these advertising contracts with government, with, which explains why they were very um, supportive of certain policies in Peña's Nieto's government. And then oh, there's also have been a lot of controversy for serious media publishing fake news as, as if they were true without actually fact checking or how another um, very popular TV anchor uh, in Televisa named uh, Carlos Loret de Mola. He also fabricated high profile cases from the Afghanistan war to um, a very famous case in Mexico, Florence Cassez. Uh, she, she is a French citizen that was imprisoned for years, accused of um, kidnapping uh, 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 various citizens, but then the case didn't kind of sustain itself and she was imprisoned for many years and the Supreme Court ruled in her favor. And then, um, but then it was, uh, discovered that Loret de Mola had fabricated uh, all of the case so he could broadcast it live on, on television. And he's still there and uh, he's still um, a very popular radio anchor. So nothing really happens to them other than the criticism in social media and criticism by his peers trying to repair the paradigm. So what are the emerging issues in the spotlight? Well, right now we have a, a new government. Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador won the elections on his third attempt. Um, he said to be a populist left-wing leader, although he's not really very left-wing uh, left or progressive. He's quite very economically conservative and sometimes religious, but anyway, the emerging issues with respect to the press are extreme political pluralization. He gives two hour morning press conferences daily. Uh, so he doesn't need the intermediation of the media. He answers the questions himself. Uh, so he doesn't need to pay the media anymore to portray him in a positive light. So he has decreased government advertising contracts, but he uh, at least once a week, he publicly berates the press and complains about um, bad treatment, uh, bad coverage, uh, the establishment not wanting him, the establishment not wanting him to dig out his wrongdoing, uh, their wrongdoing and their corruption. And even genuine criticism is passed as partisan opportunism either by him, his staff, or his supporters. And they tend also to attack and mock reporters who make critical questions at the press conferences. 
also high profile journalists who complain about AMLO routinely are mocked in social media. But I mean, uh, they have a point because journalists as Loret de Mola, for instance, is always being very critical to, towards AMLO, but he's one of the 36 journalists who got advertising contracts uh, last government. So you can say that there is some truth to the allegations that these journalists are supportive of the status quo. Um, but then AMLO capitalizes those truths, you know, to make it all about him and against the press. So, in the, what, so what independent journalists do is to draw a line uh, from both the government and partisan critics. So I'm going to go quicker. So the repair paradigm hasn't really been applied to, to Mexican uh, literature. However, the word repair um, has been used to describe the new collaborative work uh, as an agent of transformation and file repair of the errors of traditional media. So my analytical strategies for the study were tracing the professional trajectories of these journalists from traditional newsroom to independent and independence and tracing their collaborations and networks as well, analyze their role perception and prof prof professional missions their new routines, agendas, and conditions of autonomy, locate their most representative and awarded works, and the publicity and discourses of these uh, works. So I'm more interested not in the content of the of the work, but the meta what Carlson calls meta journalistic discourses about the works. And then ascertaining the principles that they value in, in the public manifestos or when teaching and mentoring their peers. My methodology consisted in two phases. Um, I'm currently midway this one. Um, the first was about, uh, uh, in, uh, the first included semi-structured interviews with 12 high profile journalists involved in, coll in collaborative work. They have, won multiple awards, they authored big projects like books, documentaries, or long format pieces. They are professionally recognized by their peers. And the most important thing is that they are constant, constantly invited as authorities to public events and seminars and workshops. So you can be a high profile awarded journalist, but if you don't have networks, if you don't mentor your peers, then you, you are out of my study. <laughs> Uh, the phase two uh, of, of the study is an uh, um, conversational and discourse analysis of the public manifestos and appearances. So I'm interested in looking at remarks in, in events, seminars, workshop, or discussions panels, or public manifestos in their websites, and uh, interviews as long as they are recorded and uploaded to online repositories such as YouTube or Vimeo public statements or speeches as long as they also are recorded. And uh, I developed an analytical scheme, conversational and discourse analysis to understand in, in, in the instances where paradigm repair was being made. And so far I have assembled 13 recorded appearances from all of them, at least one per journalist and 12 transcripts either of manifestos or interviews or speeches. And these are the journalists, the uh, high profile journalists that I, I have interviewed. These three, Fernando Brito, Heriberto Paredes, and Narciso Contreras are photojournalists, which I think needs really to be uh, in, in this pack. And then Monica Gonzalez is also a photojournalist, but transmedia. And I think the most high profile ones are Marcela Turati. She has a uh, a phrase, a catchphrase, we invented the victims' news beats. So in Mexico, things are so bad that a news beat, a new news beat, is the victims of violence or of human rights violations. And Daniel Isarraga, he's like the most senior investigative journalism expert that there is. And he worked along this guy, Rafael Cabrera. Alejandro Almazan has not been very active lately, but uh, over the past, uh, the, the, the first decade and throughout 2015, 
he was like the leading journalist in narrative journalism, especially about um, narco culture and, and drug traffickers and cartels. Then we have Temoris Greco, a travel and work correspondent journalist. And then we have Daniela Pastrana, which is one of the most leading journalists in the country, not only in terms of her work, but only in terms of how she has um, motivated and mentored the emergence of several digital startups across the country. So a lot of young journalists say that it's like she is her professional models. She shows how things should be done in a new paradigm. So um, here is like a table of, of my interviews of 10 of them. Um, most of them specialized in crime, violence, street life, human rights abuses, victims. And, and, and you can see that there's something emerging here uh, as if a new kind of environment merits a new kind of uh, journalism. Uh, I have highlighted what their main works are. So either uh, reporting or stories or chronicles, uh, uh, reportage that merited the awards. Um, something interesting about them is that most of them started in, in newspapers and printed media, but now they perform their work uh, through multiple channels not only in terms of platforms, but also in terms of, for example, books or documentaries. And sometimes they stop and then they go in, in, a, in a teaching spell and they then come back for a documentary, then go back for a workshop, then a project. So they are constantly on the move and they have the ability to move uh, on, their, on their, their own initiative. And they, they, not, they either have launched, founded, or are prominent mem members of several collective networks. For example, Alejandro Almazan launched a kind of um, a group called the Periodistas Infrarrealistas. And, you know, um, bridging with uh, literary authors and literary movements uh, and using fiction and defending the need of use fiction when telling stories about violence. Um, so they are connected to connect us at uh, collaborative platforms. Fundación Gabriel Garcia Marquez, which is the, the biggest in the country, or uh, uh, well, several other networks. Uh, awards have been multiple. For example, Narciso Contreras has a Pulitzer Prize and uh, oh, sorry, I think this duplicated, but uh, Narciso Contreras has uh, earned a Pulitzer Prize uh, for his work on IP on the Syria war. Uh, well, many have earned either national or international prizes. For example, Marcela Turati, along a group of either journalists, academics or specialists, won a Premio Garcia Marquez for a work about a uh, disappearing person under uh, uh, due to, due to um, violence. So this group of journalists did government's work by locating the missing people remains, uh, by mapping all the clandestine graves of the disappeared. And, and essentially by, by working together and fixing a societal problem that authorities are ignoring. Uh, and these are examples of the highlight work. For example, uh, Daniel Izarraga and Rafael Cabrera are the authors of, of the famous La Casa Blanca de Peña Nieto, Peña Nieto's White House. Uh, it, it was a corruption case, but it, it, it didn't result in uh, President Peña Nieto's resignation. There's no Watergate like cases like in Mexico. There are very good journalism, but it, it really doesn't lead to accountability or to imprisonment or to resignations. Um, politicians in my country are simply shameless and they, they when they are caught in corruption cases, they, they just don't do anything. Uh, they just uh, act as if nothing happened. Uh, Los Acapulco kids, so all of these are, uh, this is a big uh, photographic gallery from one of our 
um, photojournalist in the sample. And this is a transmedia work about also victims of displacement and enforced disappearance and so forth. So I only, I also have three pending interviews with uh, three high profile journalists. I have their, uh, <clears throat> the public manifestos, but um, due to the uh, pandemic, I haven't been able to interview them yet. So my emerging findings, to do it uh, quickly, because I think I'm running out of time, is that these journalists began their professional trajectories by drifting apart from organizational structures. So, uh, so one of them says that then you start to lose respect for your editor and then you try to abandon the newsroom. Uh, this journalist complains that uh, that hierarchy, the newsroom hierarchies are very vertical and structured, and uh, but they want to, you know, to drift away from traditional newsrooms. This this one says that there is a point in life when you no longer have anything else to learn from newsrooms. And so reporters, I, I like his quote here because he says, I think reporters change much faster than media do. And that's why they are repairing the paradigm. They realize much quicker than, that they can restore their professional reputation and they don't have to be attacked by, by the mobs or by the president when they are not to be blamed. And the, the, the ones to be blamed are uh, media owners rather than them. Um, they, are, they, they, are, they have also conquered autonomy uh, in a battle for freedom and control of their work that they eventually won. Um, and examples of how they have broken free to rebuild the paradigm is Daniela Pastrana. Here is she again. She attended one of uh, Lopez Obrador's press conferences and confronted him. And, he, and she said, and she reminded journalists that um, many journalists in the neoliberal period that preceded AMLO's government got out of the traditional media and became independent. They published books and even were prosecuted for that and had to leave the country. During that neoliberal period that you accuse of, or us of, journalists had um, earned international recognition and they documented topics like La Casa Blanca de Peña Nieto, as I said, uh, the disappearing of 43 journalists and, and several uh, mass killings that took place. So um, AMLO had to do a U-turn and said that his problem is not with journalists, but with the big media. Uh, well, I had a... <laughs> Sorry, I, um, it was just a quote. She is essentially setting herself apart from those journalists who undermine uh, the big critical efforts that uh, journalists like her conduct. So she's repairing the paradigm saying, I'm not like them, I'm different myself. Um, and, and she launched this network in 2007 called Periodistas de a Pie, so journalists on foot or layman journalists. So they are not as famous as the others. And, um, and in her manifesto, they say that we aim to raise the quality of journalism in Mexico through training, exchange of investigative techniques, and so forth. And uh, the important thing is that the model encourages collaborative work. It's unprecedented, and they work with civil society organizations and build a network of collaborators and have publishing agreements. So by doing this, they are doing things differently from traditional media. This is their own now digital um, outlet called Pia de Pagina. Um, so Pastrana is always saying that the new kind of paradigm should emerge in, one, in, in which 
journalists uh, report on the size of the victims of human rights abuses. Now we have Daniel Isarraga, don't think I have time to, to run uh, the little video, but uh, he, he speaks about restoring the investigative paradigm by taking it in our own hands. So in the first words he says that one of the greatest challenges to solve is the lack of investigative journalism in the country. He says, it has been journalists rather than the media who has had to solve the problem of, of this lack of investigative journalism because, because newsrooms sacrifice investigative journalists for being too expensive. So he, he took the issue in his own hands and now he tours the country and the continent um, mentoring other journalists on how to conduct rigorous, um, well fact-checked reporting. Mirai. Um, this is La Casa Blanca de Peña Nieto. It's actually white, that's why it's, it's, it was called that way. And the president only apologized, but he didn't resign. And the third case study for, well, not case study, but the third example for this talk is Marcela Turati, and how her kind of paradigm is to narrate people's tragedy and also looking after ourselves. And she speaks about resilience, and how she has to build emotional resources for journalists, not only to deal with other people's tragedies, but also with their own tragedies of being always prosecuted and, and, and having to endure this anti-press violence and the killing of many of, of her dear friends across the country. Um, uh, for example, they, she and Alejandra Shani, one of my pending interviews, they launched a website called Quinto Elemento, which is a mentoring project or program or platform for young journalists. And on top, they also conduct their own investigative journalism as well. But what is interesting is that their societal mission is to help build a society where most Mexicans have a life with dignity and justice. We position ourselves in that side. So they are breaking free from the objectivity paradigm and want to empower citizens, strengthen accountability, and help build a more just and transparent society. That's in their manifesto. And Alejandro Almazan, which is the last, um, the last of the examples for today, he sets himself aside from YouTubers. He says that narrative journalism should, should be the paradigm that uh, new journalism graduates should pursue, but that doesn't mean they shouldn't verify, and in that since they are very different from YouTubers and other uh, peripheral actors in the field. So in a nutshell, and just to close, why are they pushing the boundaries to repair the paradigm? Because they build alliances with national and international networks to distribute work, learn methods and secure funding and support. Because they develop robust digital or multimedia projects uh, not only digital startups, but all sorts of projects, because they develop their own recognizable style, because they specialize in in-depth coverage of marginalized topics. And this results in them building a name and a brand for themselves, either as individuals or as project leaders, as in the case of Pastrana with Periodistas de Apie. They not only train constantly, but also promote their own training. That means they train other uh, people and they are always advocating for professionalization outside universities and uh, on formal settings. They mentor other journalists and also teach journalism students and, and therefore they are cre slowly creating a new school of thought and practice. So what kind of paradigm of journalism roles and narratives are they creating or restoring? So, so my emerging conclusion is that um, they are kind of advocating on the one hand for watchdog of, for traditional watchdog journalism and fact checking, and also for victim centered civic like journalism. So all of this spoke about them, or for literally journalism or narrative innovation, and uh, for the case in the case of photojournalists for authorship and artistic contribution for transmedia and storytelling innovation and for multimedia narratives and long format. 
So this means that the new paradigm repair consists not only on professional missions, but also on narrative styles as well. So as in Spanish, we say fondo and forma. Um, this is the last slide. Paradigm repair are, and building is a painful cyclical work and is not free from controversies. There is still not a consensus of what the new paradigm should be, but there is consensus about what it should be not. The old paradigm isn't homogeneous either. There are a lot of things to be criticized, but boundaries are being redrawn. Many of these journalists have, of course, vocal detractors, and some even have been accused of questionable practices as well. For example, picture doctoring, fiction, passing fiction as facts. And, and while they have uh, international and national recognition, there is always this kind of old breed that wants to defend the status quo. And, and I guess that's all for today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Marquez. That was an expansive and insightful talk. I want to go quickly because we have one question from the audience. Uh, so if you could offer us a quick answer. Um, Jairo Lugo Ocando wants to ask, uh, oh, Hi, Jairo. Can you expand more about how paradigm repair as a notion applies when we analyze cases of collaborative journalism networks that encompass uh, several countries, such as the Panama Papers? So can international networks of investigative journalism change uh, the journalistic paradigm in a national context? And if so, aren't we assuming a universal paradigm of reporting? No, I think um, what changes with collaborative networks of journalism is the paradigm of the Clark Kent style of journalism mm -hmm. and the lone, uh, the lone wolf um, journalists. So it's no longer about one person. Now it is teams, Daniel Isarraga and Marcela Turati speak about how uh, the more, the merrier, and the more, the better. And I think that's a very classic paradigmatic case. In Latin America, we are used to learn about um, single journalists like uh, a talented, you know, outstanding journalists like Gabriel Garcia Marquez, like um, so many others. And right now, the, the paradigm is shifting and it's not about the, the individual figure anymore, but what they do with their talent to empower others and, and their peers. Thank you so much, Mireja, for a fabulous talk uh, and a great answer to Jairo's question. Uh, you know, in the other end of the world, he's joining us um, you know, by video. Uh, thank you, Jose Luis, for great uh, introduction and moderation. Thank you to our audience for uh, having stayed with us through the end. This is the last uh, seminar of the fall quarter series. We're going to come back uh, in the winter. We have a great lineup uh, that we're going to communicate in a couple of weeks. Um, but I want to thank everybody uh, for joining us uh, today and in the other uh, events of this quarter, if they had a chance. And in particular, thank our great speaker today for a very, very uh, thoughtful and very timely presentation and wish everybody a great rest of the week. Those in the US, a happy Thanksgiving holiday. Bye now. <laughs>